right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, many of you will not be joining us for the first time. You are joining us for our last of our 20-part Week of Wonder epic series as part of Science Literacy Week. So Science Literacy Week, Canada's largest science festival happening coast to coast to coast, hundreds of virtual and in-person events happening. And so we wanted to celebrate with all of Canada's greatest science centers. We wanted to showcase their top-notch virtual programs to encourage you to go back in person. Many of them are open again. It's just a really exciting time to be alive in general. Plus we have kids in classes. Kids, give yourselves a big hand, pat yourselves on the back. So nice to have you guys back in the classroom for a really exciting new school year. And thank you so, so much for spending some of your first few weeks with us as an organization. Now, we are diving in today on our final week of Wonder program in one of my very favorite topics. When I got the, the master list of all the topics, I went, that's the one I want to watch. So even if I wasn't hosting, I'd be here as a guest with some popcorn, enjoying this, and I hope you guys are as pumped as I am. We are going to talk about dinosaurs and climate change. It's like a mashup of two of the coolest, most awesome topics I can imagine. We're going to learn a little bit about what life was like in the time of the dinosaurs. Let's just gather together and remember again, there was a part of world's history where there were giant reptiles that ruled the world. Not that, that long ago in the scheme of thing of the world, which is very, very cool. So I'm excited to dive in. I hope you guys are too. Let's buckle up together. And I'm gonna turn it over to the team at the museum to blow our minds. So ladies, thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. Um, so hi everyone joining us. My name is Sarah and I'm the family experience coordinator here at the museum. Um, we are in downtown Kitchener right now, which is on Ontario. Um, my colleague Riley is here as well, who is our makerspace manager at the museum. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Riley is one of my favorite people at the museum and outside. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> All right. So I'm not sure where everyone else is tuning in from, but as I mentioned, we are in Kitchener in the province of Ontario. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the museum before we get started. Uh, the land that we're on since we are filming right now. I want to mention that downtown Kitchener is on, on Ontario um, and the land has been home to Indigenous people for generations. As settlers, we're grateful for the chance to be here and we thank all of the past people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been Indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. For the museum's region, these people are the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The museum is on the land called the Haldeman Tract. That was promised to the Six Nations. That promised land inc includes six miles on either side of the Grand River, which is a huge waterway that runs through our region all the way down to Lake Erie. So here at the museum, we have an exhibition called Dinosaurs, the Age of Big Weird Feathered Things. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the climate then. And right now we have some pretty intense seasons. So we have winter, we have spring, we have summer and fall, but it was a very different millions of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth. And we're gonna talk about the different eras and we're gonna focus mostly on the Cretaceous period because that's where most of our dinosaurs here um, at the museum are from. So in the Triassic period, it was generally pretty dry over most of the Pangaea, which means we had hot summers and very cold winters. It also had a highly seasonal monsoon um, near the coast. So during this period, it was warmer than today and we had no ice caps, though it did get colder the further you went away from the equator. During the Jurassic period, which was after the Triassic period, it was hot and humid. There were a lot of tropical breezes. During this time, there was a subtropical feel and the dry deserts became green. The Jurassic period was very lush in general, which means there's a lot of vegetation. So there's a lot of things for a lot of the herbivores to eat. And then the Cretaceous period, which is the one that we're gonna focus on. Um, during this time, the world where we currently live is um, was much warmer back then. So it was probably the warmest worldwide of that eon. Uh, there were tropical slash subtropical conditions um, and they existed in the north and temperate to the poles. So the Cretaceous period would have been humid and it had a seasonal rainfall. So I'm talking a lot about the climate, but it's changed a lot since then. And sometimes the climate changing is just natural and that's what happens in the world. But currently, um, when we talk about climate change, when you say climate change in 2021, we're usually talking about um, the increase of 
carbon dioxide produced by fossil fuels, which is, you know, old things that we've kind of used as energy. So we're going to produce our own carbon dioxide right now. So carbon dioxide is a gas. So right now it looks like I have some kind of weird looking bottle here with dinosaurs on it. Very lovely. Um, but inside of this bottle, there is some vinegar. And I know that you guys have probably seen a lot of vinegar and baking soda things going on um, in experiments, but we're not going to make a volcano right now. What I have here in this balloon is um, baking soda. And I'm going to put this on and we're going to see what happens to this balloon when the baking soda and the vinegar um, come together. All right, let's see. All right, so it's expanding with gas right now. So inside of this balloon is actually carbon dioxide and it's getting a lot bigger and I'm afraid it's gonna pop in my face, but that's kind of, that might be kind of fun for you guys. So what happened right now? Like what's happening right now? That's a good question. I'm gonna take it off actually. It's gonna definitely pop in my face. Oh, well, we'll see. I can't take it off. <laughs> okay, so what is happening right here? Um, the balloon is expanding and not just with air. So the vinegar and the baking soda mix together to make an acid base reaction. The reaction creates carbon dioxide gas that bubbles up from the mixture. So you can kind of see if I show you that there's a lot of bubbling going on in here. I'll try to, there's so much bubbling happening right there. Um, the gas expands up and out of the bottle and it inflates the balloon. So as you can see, carbon dioxide can be made from a lot of things. One of the biggest mass extinctions that happened was a massive and rapid or predominantly volcanic um, carbon dioxide emission, which was what kind of started out the Triassic period. But now that I've talked a lot about carbon dioxide and I'm talking about all these dinosaurs, we should probably take a look at the dinosaurs that we have at the museum. So we're I'm just talking about climate. Let's start off with our oviraptor. So our oviraptor um, doesn't actually have feathers, though in real life, oviraptors definitely do have feathers. And as you can see, they would want to warm their eggs. Even though back in the day with dinosaurs, it was quite warm, the oviraptors still wanted to keep their eggs warm and their feathers would have helped that. Warming an egg makes it grow quickly and the Cretaceous period was also very warm, so eggs would have had good conditions to grow. This is our Cynosopteryx. This dinosaur was our first hope that feathered dinosaurs existed and was the first fossil ever found of a dinosaur who wasn't a bird but happened to have feathers. We can make decisions about the climate that this dinosaur lived in because these feathers were used to keep them warm. The Cretaceous period inhabited more tropical slash subtropical climate, and both the Cafuciosaurus and the Microraptor are two bird-like dinosaurs from the early Cretaceous period. Luckily for them, there were many trees for them to glide from, and the trees would have helped them regulate the high temperatures in their homes by taking out the CO2 and releasing water vapor instead. The greenery was helping a lot to combat the high temperature and keep these dinosaurs cool because the Cretaceous period has the highest oxygen levels of any of the Mesozoic periods, which means it's hotter, there's less sunlight, and it feels wet and sticky when you go outside. Like some of the dinosaurs that we saw before, the Velociraptor is also from the Cretaceous period, but they lived in the later end of it, causing them to have evolved a bit differently than the two dinosaurs we just saw. Velociraptors did have feathers on their arms, but they are mainly used for display in aerodynamics because their arms were too short for flight. The feathers also could have been used to shield them from the cold whenever a cooling trend came through because they experienced seasonal climatic conditions and changes kind of similar to the ones we do. If I were standing next to a Suchomimus, my eye level would be at its knees. They're 12 feet tall and grow to be 36 feet long. Despite their size, razor sharp teeth and massive claws, the Suchomimus primarily eats fish, which makes them pretty lucky to have lived in the middle of the Cretaceous period. They would have benefited off of the seasonal rainfall because it made the water levels rise and that made it a lot easier for them to catch fish. The climate, if you remember it, keeps things pretty warm, which also benefits the Suchomimus because they are cold-blooded. Here we have our first dinosaur in a different period of the Mesozoic, the Stegosaurus. The dinosaur grew up to nine meters long and lived in the Jurassic period, which was still really hot, but was also humid and breezy. It had the highest levels of 
carbon dioxide out of all of the periods, which was good for our friend the Stegosaurus because it meant the land was full of lush greenery for them to eat. We also discovered in 1896 due to Uni's Foot's research that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases are gases that get trapped in Earth's atmosphere and heat the planet, which explains why the Jurassic period was so hot. Moving on to the Triassic period, we have the Coleophysis. Unlike the other dinosaurs that we've seen, the Coleophysis lived in a much drier climate, and though still hot, they experienced a lot more variation in seasonal temperature change. And since they were also a cold-blooded dino, the Coleophysis also benefited from the warmer temperatures they experienced in the Triassic period. And though it was cooler than the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, it was still a lot warmer than temperatures we reach today. Jumping back to the late Cretaceous period where our friends the Velociraptors are from, you can also find the predator king of the dinosaurs, the Tyrannosaurus rex, or T-Rex as I like to call them. This dinosaur often grew up to be 12 feet tall and 40 feet long, which is basically the length of a school bus. They didn't always start out that large. But we're going to find out a little bit more about baby dinosaurs later. So this is just a little bit of our dinosaur exhibit here at the museum in downtown Kitchener, Ontario. Now we're going to show you a little surprise that we have here at the museum. Thank you so much for watching and we hope to see you downtown soon. All right, so I'm back and I have a friend with me right now. So this is Turnip. So Turnip is a baby T-Rex. And as you can see, Turnip has some feathers. And um, when T-Rexes were babies, they had feathers, but as they grew up, they kind of shed their feathers. And um, they didn't really find a need for them later on. So when Turnip was alive, it was a lot warmer on Earth. And since it's gotten colder, dinosaurs like Turnip would not be able to survive on this Earth. Um, and the change of the weather. So if Turnip was really here and if Turnip's family was all here, I don't think he would be able to survive as long as he would have back in that, um, back in the Mesozoic era. So Turnip's going to hang out with us for the rest of this thing, but I have Riley who's going to show you guys something about a barometer. Really quickly before I go to Riley, I want to say turnip is the best thing ever. It's like the greatest thing I've ever seen. Okay, cool. <laughs> Riley, come on in. Turnip is pretty cute. All right, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we talked a little bit about dinosaurs and climate, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the atmosphere as well as how to measure pressure. So if any of you have ever watched the weather network or the temperature or whatever on TV at some point, you may see they show you a map. And on that map, you may see the letter H and the letter L. So those are just showing you high and low pressure, okay? And we're going to talk about that and what a barometer does to detect that and how it can be used for predicting the temperature or the weather that you're about to see. So like I said, they're talking about atmospheric pressure. So the atmosphere, so I have my little diagram of the earth here. So the atmosphere is the air that surrounds the planet. Okay. Oh, my pink pen is a little, a little uh, scarce there, but it's the, the air that is around the earth. And it's actually a 300 mile thick layer of air that's all around us, okay, in our atmosphere. So the air is made up of molecules such as nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. So Sarah talked about carbon dioxide. We all know what oxygen is. We use it to breathe, okay? So we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide, okay? So all of these molecules press down on the earth. And this phenomenon is called atmospheric pressure or barometric pressure, which is what you, when you see that H and that L on the weather showing you, they're talking about that. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means and how it can be used to predict the forecast. Okay. So it might surprise you to learn actually that air has weight. Okay. So although we don't see it, we can't see the air around us. Sometimes you can in certain examples, such as if you're outside in the cold and you breathe and you can see your breath, right? So you can see that, but normally we can't see air. It's just around us and we know it's there. And humans have evolved so that the pressure inside of our bodies, so we all have pressure inside of our bodies. So we have it that our bodies can actually match the pressure that's outside of them. Okay. Now, 
However, you might experience changes. So if anybody has ever been in a plane or you know, gone up in a gondola or something like that where you're really high up or maybe you're even driving and you go up a really big hill and suddenly your ears start to hurt and you're like, oh my goodness, what is that? That's a change in pressure, in atmospheric pressure. So your ears, the only way for you to balance that is by swallowing or popping your ears, okay? So that's getting your body to balance itself to the pressure inside as well as outside, okay? So the other thing, atmosphere. So the pressure is highest, okay, at sea level. So when you think of sea level, that's where the pressure is the highest. It's keeping, think of it, it's, it's helping keep the water down. Otherwise the water would float up everywhere, right? And then it decreases as you go up. So pressure decreases as you go up and increases as you come down. Okay. Now I could go on and on and on and on, but let's talk about the weather and the atmosphere. So warm air rises. We know this. If you ever have been in your house in the wintertime, you may notice that it's actually warmer maybe upstairs than it is in your basement, right? Hot air rises. So the weather and the atmosphere pressure, warm air rises, so it's less dense, which results in low pressure, okay? So warm equals low pressure. Now imagine it's suddenly you're outside and it's hot, so you're all kind of splayed out. That's kind of what the molecules are doing. They're stretched out, okay? So they're all expanded. And then when it gets cold, they come in, sort of like we do. So they become more dense and heavier, which increases pressure, okay? So low pressure, what does that mean? So because warm air rises, it goes up into the atmosphere. And as it rises, it eventually cools and it turns into water vapor, which creates clouds and can create rain. So low pressure leads to rain. When it's high density, cold air is sinking, it dries, causing warm and dry weather. Okay, so high pressure leads to warm and dry. Low pressure leads to rain and cold. All right, so now we know how that works and we can use that to predict. We're going to create a barometer. So a barometer is used to detect pressure, which can predict the forecast. So here we have our um, list of supplies. If you wanna try this at home, you can take a picture of this and uh, try it at home. So what you will need is a heat proof jar. I've got a mason jar here. You're gonna need a balloon, some scissors, a skewer, or you can use a straw, tape, rubber band, a bowl, hot and cold water, and a towel. So we're going to do this. We're going to take the balloon, and I'm going to cut the tail off of it and put it over top of my jar, okay? Now, I need this to be super tight. So I'm going to use my rubber band to keep it in. So that little floofy bit, that's not gonna work for us. So we're going to stretch it and pull your elastic over. Oh, this is why I have extras. My elastic rope have extras. You may have somebody help you. So what I'm doing is I'm trapping air into the jar, okay? So we're gonna watch how the pressure changes. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a skewer and I'm gonna be just about in the middle. I'm going to tape my skewer down. I'm sorry, I'm speeding up. I'm conscious of our time here. So we're going to tape that on just like this, okay? Now, what you can do and we're going to see how it changes the once we have pressure. We're going to simulate that. I can't change the outside pressure of this, but I can change the inside using different temperatures of water. So what I'm going to do is take my barometer and I'm going to set it in a bowl. And I'm going to fill the bowl with hot water. So be careful. This is hot water. And what's going to happen is that air, because it's hot, it's gonna expand. Remember how I was saying that uh, when you get hot, you kind of splay out? So I'm expanding that air. You can see that it's actually now coming up, okay? So you will notice 
if I line this up to my my um, my uh, board here, I'm going to mark down that this is low. Okay, so that's my low pressure. I can see that. You can mark that on a piece of paper. And now I'm going to see what happens when I do this with cold water. So I have ice water. I'm just going to dump this out. Okay, so it's still expanded. Okay, now watch what happens when I fill it with ice water. So it will float a little bit. I'll hold it down. And you'll notice that it's going to start to retract. So I don't, can you see that my barometer, my skewer is now going up? So what's happening is the balloon is, the air inside is contracting. So now it's created high pressure. So see how the skewer now has gone up. So now it's at a higher, so that's my high pressure with the cooler water. Now you can create this at home very easily and you can set this up against a piece of paper outside on your porch or near your window. So I have one here that I can use and you can even draw a little diagram so you know what's going to happen. Okay. So you can predict. So if your barometer starts to move and you've got it marked down on a piece of paper, then you can kind of predict what the weather's going to be. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. One thing to, to mention, I know we're getting close to our time, but we can't, remember how I said, I can't physically change the external pressure in this room right now, for example. So in my demonstration, I did that with the bowls of water, okay? So like I said, the air is inside of the mason jar and I sealed it and I heated it up and then I cooled it off, which created those changes external pressure will do the very opposite. So external pressure, if it's really high pressure, is going to push this in, okay, and retract it. And if it's external, it's going to go up. So the best thing to do is just practice around with it. Make one of these. You can draw little diagrams to kind of help you remember what maybe the day, the temperature looked like on those days and have fun with kind of creating your own, uh, your own weather forecast. So thank you guys for joining me with that. And I hope you had fun uh, and a happy making. I'll have that again if you want to take a picture of the, uh, the supplies and you can have fun with trying that at home. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Riley. And of course, our folks can tune in on YouTube both live and after the fact. They can see how you did these demos. They can take part themselves anytime. So if you want to go home, play this, do it in slow-mo, whatever you want. Lots of opportunities to keep the learning going. We've got a whole whack of folks joining us on YouTube. If you are on YouTube, you want to share where you're joining from in the chat, please do. We'll take some questions from you guys. But I want to kick us off with our live question. So live teachers, everyone can unmute your mics. It'll make it way easier for Q&A. Uh, we can't hear you until I bring you in the broadcast. So no worries about being too loud. We love your enthusiasm. And we're going to start with Miss Woodley's class. Miss Woodley's class is joining us today in Brantford, Ontario, 3 fourths. Come on up, guys, and kick us off. If you have any questions for Riley or for Sarah at the museum with Turnup. <laughs> Okay, guys. Do planets need Yeah, sorry, Ms. Woodley. Can you repeat that a little closer to the camera for us? Can you hear us in middle of this class? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just really quiet. Can you can you hear us okay? That's better. <laughs> Climate change the dinosaurs. What? Yeah, did, did, you guys, did you guys catch that? Did climate change the dinosaurs? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think I got that. Um, so yeah, that climate definitely changed the dinosaurs. Um, when organisms living li living organisms grow up they have to adapt to the weather. And as you can see, uh, this guy, he wouldn't really be able to survive in the weather that we have now. So um, the dinosaurs, because the dinosaurs don't live, aren't on earth right now, they do have some, um, I would say that the closest living relative to a dinosaur is a chicken. So they do definitely change the animals. They're just, um, they just kind of 
morph into different things. Excellent, guys. All right, let's head to our second class, St. George School. So this is Mrs. Natoom's class, joining us in Ottawa. Do you want to come on in? Go for it. Hi, guys. Um, why did dinosaurs die in the ice age? Ooh, in the Ice Age. Okay, we might have a little nuance here with this question, guys. Sarah, come on in. Well, um, dinosaurs weren't around for the Ice Age. Um, but the, di uh, the dinosaurs would have died because, well, there's a big meteor, and that hit. And so what that did was that killed a lot of organisms that um, dinosaurs like the T-Rex would have eaten. And so let's just say that you're at home and all you have to eat is crackers. Eventually, you're going to get really sick and you're going to need different types of food. And so um, think about having crackers for the rest of your life for like 40 years. Um, you're definitely going to change. And that's sort of what happened to dinosaurs. So a lot of what killed the dinosaurs was the meteor hitting Earth. It was really, really, really big. And um, a lot of carbon dioxide came out of volcanoes, which um, really wasn't great for some sort of living organisms. But um, the Ice Age would have been too cold for any, any dinosaur to live, really. Um, they, don't, they didn't have fur. So fur is, and, and a lot of um, animals in the Ice Age had like blubber and like things to keep them warm. And unfortunately, the dinosaurs could not keep warm in the Ice Age. Yeah. So again, Ice Age is a much more recent in time. This is something that's really hard to understand for a lot of classes, but it was something that I had to struggle with when I was younger as well. Ice Ages are in the last 10 to 100,000 years. This is very, very recent. It sounds very far in the past. 100,000 years sounds crazy. Dinosaurs were wiped out about 65 million years ago. So it's on the order of 100 to 1,000 times further back in the past when we had dinosaurs. Uh, ice Ages are in our lifetime. We're likely to go through Ice Ages again, uh, whereas the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs was a true cataclysmic event. This is something that's happened only a few times in the history of the Earth, a scale of extinction unlike almost anything else for about 200 million years before that. So Ice Age is pretty recent. Dinosaurs wiped out way, way further back. Good question, guys. All right, Blair McPherson School, Miss Barrett with the Love Rose class. Come on in and take right us away. Go ahead, Julia. What's the biggest dinosaur in the world? The biggest dinosaur in the world. We were talking about this in a broadcast the other day. So if you know offhand, bring Sarah in. If not, I can dive in. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I don't know the biggest dinosaur. Maybe maybe the T-Rex, but honestly, that's me guessing. Yeah. I I don't I don't yeah. know. No worries at all. Riley's giving me a big no too. So it depends. If we're talking about carnivores, guys, T Rex was one of the heaviest carnivores ever. I think it was the heaviest carnivore that we've actually discovered. An incredible, incredible animal right here in Canada. So we had T Rexes in North America. A really, really special organism. In terms of the biggest dinosaur ever, we're looking at the sauropods. Some of you might have heard of or seen Brontosaurus or Brachiosaurus. Now, these are huge, huge animals. The so things that look sort of like that would have been the biggest dinosaurs. And whether you're looking at heaviest or tallest or longest, it depends. We're also finding more different kinds of these every single year. So it's really exciting. We keep exploring and finding new dinosaurs. More dinosaurs are being discovered now than ever in history. But what we're looking at is an animal that's on the scale of about 30 to 40 elephants. So it's massive. It's, 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 it's tens and tens of tons. It's 100,000 pounds of this creature. And some of the longer ones we know got to be over 100 feet long. And the tallest one, our Brachiosaurus, could stand 45 feet at the top of its head. So just incredible, unbelievable dinosaurs. And again, hopefully you guys get the chance to go to a museum in person, see some of these specimens. Again, they're all just fossils now, but dinosaurs are really, really special creatures. So great question, guys. All right, let's head to Ms. LeBlanc's class, grade sixes. They're joining us today and do, 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 do. they're joining us today. Oh, I have so many things in my thing. Canada, Ontario, welcome in, Ms. LeBlanc. Unmute your mic and come on in. There we go. Take your time. All good. <laughs> uh, my question was, how were dinosaurs like made? Were they, were they um, did they come from bacteria? Yeah, all right, the scale of life. Sarah, you want to come on in? Where are well, dinosaurs coming from? Um, they most animals came from, uh, I guess bacteria. Like, Ultimately. um, <laughs> it really depends on what kind of dinosaur it was. But a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of animals evolve into something else, and like different species will get together and and make some sort of other one. But, um. A lot of the dinosaurs 
they didn't just kind of plop up on earth out of nowhere. Right. Um, it really was just um, evolution making right. these dinosaurs. Yeah. I mean, for, uh, uh, I guess, a more detailed answer, the bacteria, so small single-celled organisms underpin everything. Everything on Earth is related. It's one of the coolest facts in all of science that we all share DNA. So we, you are, in some sense, related to bacteria. You're related to trees. You're related to chimps. You're related to all sorts of creatures. Everything that exists on Earth is related from a single common ancestor about 3.7 billion years ago. It's really quite unfathomable to think of 3.7 billion years. If the scale of life on Earth were the stretch of my arms, humankind appears, so this is the beginning of time, this is the present day, we appear in the shaving on the tip of my middle fingernail. Humans have been around for about 200,000 years, it's a very, very small fraction of time. Dinosaurs on this scale appear somewhere on the other scale, right about here. Most of life on Earth was single-celled organisms, and then slowly but surely we got more complicated celled organisms, two and four and six and more cells, and we start getting things coming on land about 360 million years ago. Things that are like us, things that are like amphibians and reptiles come on land. Some lineages of those branch off and become your crocodilians, your turtles. Some of them became the dinosaurs, which by the way, still exist today as birds. And some of them ultimately split off to become us as mammals. So we have little reptilian things that are coming out about 360 million years ago, 300 million years ago. Dinosaurs as a lineage appear about 250 million years ago and rule the planet for a very, very long period of time. Over a thousand times longer than humans have been on this planet, dinosaurs ruled the earth. So it's a really, really cool evolutionary story. And I love that question. Thanks guys. All right, uh, let's go back to St. George or uh, Miss Woodley's class. I'll come to you guys first. That was the order. Uh, if you guys want to come on in, go for it. Thanks, guys. Just be nice and loud. Just remember your mic's a little quieter than most. You want to hear you guys. Hey. Other animals at that time? Yeah, any other animals at the time of the dinosaurs, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, so there were some birds. So there are dinosaurs and there are birds, and there were um, mammals that were there. So the dinosaurs didn't just eat other dinosaurs. Um, there are definitely other animals that I'm totally blanking on right now, but there were not just dinosaurs, I believe. Riley wants to dive in. She pointed herself. Hey, Riley. Yeah, I know the answer to this question. So back then we had animals sort of similar to crocodiles. So as we kind of talked about, dinosaurs weren't exactly like reptiles, how we think of reptiles today. They were more bird-like. Um, and they didn't really have that scaly skin that we used to think, right? But crocodiles were around at the time, a lot of snakes, even some types of bees, sharks, crabs, um, what are they, uh, sea stars, uh, starfish, yeah, like Patrick, lobsters, and even something very similar to the duck-billed platypus. So those animals have all been said to have coexisted with dinosaurs at the same time. Yeah, I love this idea of mammals existing then. So our ancestors, the things that ultimately led to us, about 200 million years ago, we start getting them on the scene. And it'd be something like a shrew or a mouse, something that looks something like that. Not the current day shrew and mouse, but things that were like them way back when, sort of biding time in the shadows, and they capitalize beautifully on the loss of the dinosaurs on the whole. And that's how we end up with us, with rhinos, with horses, with all the amazing creatures that we think of today when most of us think of animals. Great question, guys. All right, St. George School, grade threes. Uh, your camera's off, so you might still be in. Hopefully, you're still in the broadcast with us. If you want to unmute your mic, and we can take a question from you. If not, we'll head to Blair McPherson next. Uh, how about I head to Blair McPherson, and we'll come back if you guys have another question for us at St. George School. Okay. So come yeah, on, guys. Go ahead, Anwar. Uh, how did dinosaurs stay cool? How did dinosaurs stay cool? I love it. Great question. All right, we'll bring in Riley and Sarah. Either of you want to feel this, go. So Sarah, you did mention it in your um, in your tour. Yeah, I did mention it in my tour. Um, I I get a little bit stage shy, and I sometimes forget. Very casual, but listen, being on camera in front of hundreds of kids is a little nerve wracking for me sometimes too, and I've done this a thousand times. So. Uh, Riley, did you catch it? Do you want to explain a little bit more about it or I can Yeah, so uh, feathers are also so very, very, very light. So as Sarah had mentioned as well back then that it was a lot warmer. So they 
didn't have, that's why we don't have as many mammals back then. So as evolution, we've gotten hair um, to keep warm. And um, you think about like those animals that live in the Arctic, like whales or sea lions, even polar bears and penguins, they have that layer of blubber that keeps them um, that keeps them warm. The opposite kind of happens with the dinosaurs. So they don't need that. So they have that, um, there, a lot of them were cold blooded. Uh, so it was okay to kind of be up. That's why you see a lot of those desert animals are kind of more of that reptile. -y. I don't know. I already just said that dinosaurs aren't quite reptiles, but they kind of are. Um, so it's like when you see in the desert, there's lots of snakes and reptiles and stuff. So they're very similar. So they lay out, they want this, the, the sun, they want the heat and uh, to keep cool. And they also would find shade, lots of water and their feathers too could be a little bit of a, uh, a fanning kind of thing as well. I love it. I'm glad you mentioned shade and water. This is something, honestly, if you guys go for a walk and you're in a park, it gets really hot out, where do you go? You go under a tree, so you're shaded. It's that much cooler under there. Maybe you get a drink. Maybe you go wading in the water. A lot of us go to pools or lakes or oceans during the summer. Uh, these are the same strategies that dinosaurs and all creatures throughout history would have used. Great question, guys. All right, let's head to Ms. LeBlanc's class for one more to wrap us up. Uh, come on in and take us away, guys. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, so what does dinosaur taste like? <laughs> Ooh, what do we think? Okay. I mean, I, I have an answer to this if you want to come in. I kind of have like a somewhat answer. Um, so I like to travel and I've been to New Orleans before and actually got to try crocodile. So I would imagine that dinosaur would probably taste similar to crocodile, but uh, I don't know if we're, or, or chicken because they kind of evolved into chickens. So it kind of tastes like crocodile or chicken. That's that's what I was going to say. So the only existing dinosaurs to this day are birds. If you guys have had chicken, if you've had goose or duck, it's dinosaur. You're eating dinosaur. It's the most fantastic fact that we've really only highlighted in the last 20 years. When I was a kid, scientists were still kind of unsure. There were birds, dinosaurs. There were debates about it. It is unequivocal now. Birds are the last surviving lineage of dinosaur. So if you've had chicken nuggets in the last few weeks, you have eaten some dinosaur. Very, very cool, guys. I love these great questions from everybody. Apologize for the noise. We've got some people doing demos in the apartment above me. Uh, but thank you so, so much for joining us today. Kids, I love your enthusiasm. Riley, what a great demonstration. Sarah, thanks for taking us on the tour and showing us Turn Up, the greatest T-Rex uh, of all time, your newest friend. Um, and what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our live class to say a big thank you and farewell. So Blair McPherson, Miss Woodley, Miss LeBlanc's class, unmute those mics. Come on in with me, and we'll say goodbye to Turnip, Riley, and Sarah together. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye for now, guys.